Hey, will you stand with me? We're, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 3. So I'm going to read those, and you can follow along. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have a seat. Hey, I want to share with you an uh, interesting, somewhat funny list I stumbled across on uh, the internet this week. It's, it's a list of church names. And so here we go. You ready? The first one is the Accidental Baptist Church. So clearly they're not Calvinist, right? Here's another one. This is a good one. The first church of the last chance world on fire revival and military academy. Where do you think that church is? Anybody? Yeah, if you said Florida, you're right. Where else? How about this one? Hellhole Swamp Baptist Church. I would say that being seeker-friendly is not high on their priority list with a name like that. Or here's one, No Hope Methodist Church, which should not be confused with Little Hope Baptist Church, which is still better than No Hope, right? Boring Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, anybody lining up to go to a service there? Here's a good one, Waterproof Baptist Church. That would make Baptism Sundays really interesting, wouldn't it? Here's my favorite. James Bond United Community Church in Toronto, which is good on its own, but wouldn't it be amazing if it was actually next door to St. Martini Lutheran Church in Milwaukee? Shaken, not stirred. Then there is this one, Hell for Certain Church in Kentucky. What, what even? <laughs> what even? And then finally you got this, Lover's Lane Episcopal Church. Can I just say this? Keep an eye on the youth group at that one. <laughs> Listen, in Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare wrote a famous line that we've all heard. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Well, what's in a name? Based on some of those church names, way too much. You know, the word church can mean different things to different people. As believers in Jesus, we define the church based on what Scripture tells us the church is. We don't define it simply as an organization that, that has some sense of spiritual awareness. And so as we wrap up our foundation series this week, we're going to look at our last two statements of faith. Hopefully you've gone to our website and you've read through those and you have an understanding for them. And, and as you read through them, if you have any questions, Pastor James or I would love to talk to you about them again. He's the smart one, I'm the entertaining one which doesn't say much about his level of entertainment. But um, if you want to talk through any of our statements of faith, we'd love, we'd love to talk with you. But they are the foundation of what we believe. And they're the foundation of what we want to build our lives on as the body of Christ. And remember, belief that doesn't govern how I actually live means nothing. And so we want to be a people who, as 1 Peter 2.5 says, are being built up as a spiritual house. We don't just want to point out what we don't believe to the world. We want to live out what we do believe. And for Christians, that happens in a community that's called the church. The Greek word for church is ecclesia. It literally means to call out from and to call to. And so the ecclesia in the Bible, the church, is those who are called out from the world and are called to God. Now that speaks to the salvation and the transformation that mark what it actually means to be the church. Both happen by the prevailing power of God, Spirit, at work in the church. And so I want to show you our last statement of faith as we dive into this topic. This is what our last statement of faith says. We believe in a church which is the body of Christ, a community of believers who are united by the Spirit of God. 
for the purpose of representing Christ in the world as they together worship, pray, serve, and proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ. And so here's our question this morning. What does it actually mean to be the church, the body of Christ? Not simply to be a member of a church, that's not what we're talking about, or to even attend a church, but to actually be the body of Christ, the church. Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians, addresses what it means to be the church, to be the body of Christ, and it addresses how to live it. And so I want to encourage you this week, maybe this afternoon, find some time where you can sit down and read 1 Corinthians in one sitting. Not so much to gain some kind of Bible knowledge, but to get a picture in your head of what Paul was calling the church to be in the very early days of the church itself. But this morning, we're going to focus on the first three verses. They show us that the church is made up of a people who have received a commission, have made a commitment, have a commonality, and are experiencing conversion. Those first three verses of 1 Corinthians give us four components of what it means to actually be the church. And when being the church is more about what the people inside are becoming than what the sign outside says. So if we are going to be the church of Christ, we should be engaged with those things, the commission that comes with being the church, the commitment that we as individuals make to being the church, the commonality that we all have as the body of Christ, and we should be expecting conversion. So listen to this in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Paul defines what the church is. He says this, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So, as the body of Christ, we are to be Christ incarnate in this world. As the body of Christ, we are bringing the presence of Christ into this world. And we're doing that individually in our own lives, and corporately as a local body, but also globally as the universal body of Christ throughout the centuries. And we're doing this from our time on earth right into eternity. This means that the church lives as Christ lived. Being about the Father's business so that the Son and the Father will be glorified in all that we do. And all that we do is done by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. That's what the church is. And so with that picture of the church in mind, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 says this, Paul, called by the will of God. When God called Paul, he gave him a commission, the same commission that every member of the body of Christ has ever been given. And it's a commission that starts with Jesus' words in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, when he gives his apostles the great commission. When he says, go and make disciples of all the world. But it also reaches beyond this world. The commission that we have as the church doesn't end in this world. Listen to this in Ephesians 3, 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. So Paul's saying the commission he was given was a commission to minister the grace of God. What does it mean to minister? It means to bring forth, to offer to others. So Paul's commission was to bring forth the grace of God. Now listen to verse 10 in Ephesians 3. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities, catch this, in the heavenly places. As the church... We are revealing right now today the wisdom of God to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. The commission of the church reaches not only into every corner of this world, but also into the heavenly places. To be the church, we must be heavenly minded. Now listen to this quote from C.S. Lewis. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. 
aim at earth, and you will get neither. As the church, we must be aware that our commission speaks to the state of this world, to the people in this world, but it also reaches into the heavenly places where the wisdom of God is being revealed. Think about that. God, in his infinite wisdom, said that I want all those who, I, who are in the heavenly places to understand my wisdom, and I'm going to use my church to do it. So the first point we have is to be the church. We have to recognize that we have a commission, a commission to incarnate the body of Christ in this world so that the world will know Jesus and so that God's wisdom is on display in heavenly places. That's a powerful commission, not one we should take lightly. The next component of truly being the church is also in verse 1. It says this, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now the word apostle means messenger. It implies one who has made a deep and total commitment to the cause of Christ. Now of the original 12 apostles, one, Judas, hanged himself. One, John, died of old age. The remaining 10 were all put to death for their faith. All around the world, that's commitment. The church is a people who have made a total commitment to the commission of God. It's the same commitment that Jesus invited his followers into in Matthew 16, 24. Listen to the commitment Jesus invited them into. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself is a lifestyle of commitment for the cause of Christ. It's not to be entered into casually. We have to take this commitment seriously. Paul touched on what it means to be committed to the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 9.27. He says this, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching... To others, I myself should be disqualified. This is a commitment to Christ as his body that touches every thought, belief, desire, action, word, and emotion that we have. This is no small call. This is no minor commitment. This isn't simply checking accept on your iOS update because you want to use your phone. This runs much deeper to be the church, we have to make the same commitment to the cause of Christ that the apostles made, that Paul made. So here's what we have. If we're going to be the church, we have to have a commission from God. A church that does not have a commission from God is not a church. It's an organization. It's a club. And there must be a commitment to the commission of Christ. A group of people who call themselves the church that are not committed to that cause are aimless and leaderless. Now we get to verse 2. Look, listen to this. To the church of God that is in Corinth. So remember, the word church means those called out of the world and called into God. That's commonality. There's a commonality in the church. It's a commonality that is founded in the person of Jesus Christ. And it should produce unity. Unity. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Our commonality as the church is in the person of Christ. We are called to a person, not a cause. There are many, many causes in the world that if the leader changes, the cause goes on. The church is not one of those causes. We are called to the person of Christ. And it should produce unity instead of judgment. Now, does this, Paul saying this, mean that every church is going to agree on everything? Absolutely not. The church on this earth is made up of fallen people. Look around. Start in the mirror and then look around. You'll see that the church here at Temple is made up of fallen people. There will be disagreements. That's not the question. The question is how does the true church handle disagreements when they arise? 
Well, we should handle them with humility by going to each other and talking instead of through gossip or rumor or judgment. In John 17, 23, Jesus prayed that all of the believers would be one, just as he and the Father are one. Listen, here's the punchline. So that the world would know he was sent by God. If we, the church, people who have taken that name upon ourselves and represent ourselves with our words as the body of Christ, if we backbite and gossip and talk about other churches because of differences of opinion on minor issues, we are telling the world that Jesus is not sent by God. There's nothing sadder and more worldly than local churches attacking each other for the sake of building personal empires instead of being one as the body of Christ and building the kingdom of God. Paul tells us clearly in Ephesians 4 how to handle disagreements. Listen to verses 1 through 3. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The church is marked by humility, gentleness, and patience in disagreements. Its goal is to bear with one another in love so that the unity of the Holy Spirit can be maintained in peace. Commonality in Christ breeds this in the church. You want to know if a church is the church? Pay attention to how they approach differences over the non-essentials of faith. We will disagree. That's not the question. The question to ask, if we truly want to be the church, is how will we handle disagreements when they arise? When we don't handle disagreements in an Ephesian 4 way, we give the world a reason to be skeptical of everything else that we say. So the church is marked by a commission from God. And that commission is to go and make disciples of all nations. But it's also a commission to manifest the wisdom of God in the heavenly places. The church is marked by a people who have made a commitment, a people who are not willing, who are willing to die for the cause of Christ, but unwilling to live for anything else. Let me say that again. If we're going to be the church, we should be a people who are willing to die for Christ, but unwilling to live for anything else. The church is marked by commonality, standing together in preaching nothing but knowing Jesus and Him crucified, and approaching differences over the non essentials of faith with humility and patience and unity. And here's our final component of the church that's in verse 2 to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. The church is made up of people who are experiencing conversion. Certainly conversion from sinner to saint, for sure. But also conversion from the old self who walked in the flesh to the saint who walks by the Spirit. This is the hope of the church. A hope that God is not finished with me yet and that the transforming power of the Holy Spirit will complete that work in me that he started. And the conversion that happens in the church is a radical conversion. It's not simply not using bad words or drinking anymore. It goes way deeper than that. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Is Paul actually saying here that the promiscuous, that the people who love things of the world more than God, the person who cheated on their spouse, the homosexual, the thief, the person who loves money too much, the drunk, the abuser, the tax cheat, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, yeah, that's what he's saying. But listen to verse 11. Because this is where these verses matter to us. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. 
Let me say it in a little different way. And such were some of us. But here's the game changer. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Listen, if you find yourself on that list that I just read, you don't have to remain outside of the kingdom of God. You just need a bath. You just need a bath in the blood of Jesus. You just need a conversion by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. You just need to be justified by receiving the sacrifice of Jesus as your own. And all of that happens when you put your faith in Him and you allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of conversion in your heart, in your mind. When you identify from your past as somebody who's sexually immoral or an idolater or a homosexual or a thief or greedy or a drunkard or a reviler or a swindler, when your identity is that, and you take that identity and replace it with the identity of God's beloved in Christ, then you are beginning that pathway of conversion that only happens in the church. But not only that, you're moving into the kingdom of God. Now all those things Paul mentions, none of those people are going to be in heaven. He's clear about that. But there will be people in heaven who used to be that, but you won't be that there because the only identity you will have in the kingdom of God is I am God's beloved in Christ. No matter what I used to be, no matter who I used to be, that's all I am now and that's all that matters. Listen, we don't have access to the kingdom of God because of who we are, but because of who he is, which means I am not precluded from the kingdom of God because of who I am. I'm always invited. No matter who I am, I'm always invited into the kingdom of God because of who he is. The question is, will I receive that? Will I stand before God and say, you judge me based on Christ? Or will I stand before God and say, you judge me based on me? Regardless of what you've been, he will make you a citizen of the kingdom of God by grace, through faith in Christ. And he will do the work of conversion in you by that same faith in Christ. So here's what happens. Once we accept Christ by faith, we're part of the body of Christ, the church. We have a commission from God on us. We've made a commitment to the person of Jesus. We find commonality with all those who are in the body of Christ, the church, throughout all the centuries. And finally, we discover that we're experiencing conversion into the very image of the head of the church, Jesus himself. And so you know what the end result of all that is? It's community. Community that helps us live together into the commission of God that's on us as the church. Community that encourages and strengthens our own commitment to Christ when it begins to waver. It's, com it's community that gives us a commonality, not just with this local body, but with an eternal body of Christ. It's community in which we experience deep conversion down to the very fibers of our being. See, the point of the church is to be a community. It's a community that we're called to be a part of when we're part of the church is not limited to any local church. It's the very community that we talked about a few weeks ago, the community of God himself, the Trinity, the community of love that he draws us into through Christ. And so the first step into that community is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Our eighth statement of faith is about the two ordinances that we as a church observe. Those two ordinances are baptism and communion. So first, baptism is an act of public obedience to Christ that reflects a private commitment to Christ. It's an identification with Jesus in his death and burial and resurrection through the act of being immersed in water. And when we do that, what we're saying is, I want to live a Galatians 2.20 kind of life. I want to live a life that says, it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. 
And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's saying, I want to live a life that is based solely and completely on faith in Christ. And so here's the thing. If you've never been baptized by immersion and you feel an invitation from the Holy Spirit to do that, you feel the Holy Spirit's inviting you into the commission of the church to make Jesus known in this world and in the heavenly places, if you feel the Holy Spirit's inviting you into making commitment to the person of Jesus and to his body, the church, you feel the Holy Spirit's inviting you into sharing the commonality of the life of Christ in his church, And if you have a longing for God to do a work of conversion in you, first from sinner to saint, then from saint into the very image of Christ, write this date down. On October 15th, we are going to have a baptism class. We'll tell you everything you need to know about baptism. We will help you make arrangements to take that act of obedience in Christ and actually be baptized. You can sign up when you walk out today at the rooted table in the lobby. You can go online and sign up there. Now, the second ordinance that we follow is communion. We're actually going to observe that ordinance today, here together. And so I want to invite you to do this. I want to invite you to take a moment and prepare these torturous things called communion cups. The uh, difficulty with these is that you don't spill the grape juice all over your white shirt. But I want to invite you to just take a minute, prepare these elements, but also to prepare your hearts. Prepare your heart by acknowledging the commission of God as a member of the body of Christ, his church. Prepare your heart by renewing your commitment to Christ as you prepare to take these elements. And by calling to mind the commonality that you have with every believer throughout the centuries and every believer who will come after us. Finally, I want to invite you into allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work that only He can do in you. It's the work of conversion. Here's the thing. We do this on Communion Sundays because all of us who have put our faith in Jesus are one body with Him as the head. It's important to remember that communion is not just something we do at temple, but it's something that we do as the global and eternal body of Christ. Listen to this quote from Pastor Dallas Willard. The most important task we have, especially for those in church leadership, is to pray for the success of our neighboring churches. And so as the part of the global body of Christ... We're going to pray for our neighboring churches this morning as we prepare to take communion, particularly our brothers and our sisters who are in the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches here, those those churches local to us that are part of our fellowship, Anthem Church and Blue Water Baptist Church and Huron Baptist Church. Then after we pray, and you've had a little bit of time to reflect, our band will be up here playing a song. I just want to invite you to remain in your seat. Continue to pray, to continue to reinvigorate that commission that's on you from Christ himself. To renew that commitment that you've made to Christ. To focus on the commonality that's represented in these elements that we are all under the sacrifice of Christ. All the churches in this community that call Jesus their Lord. But not only those churches every church that's ever existed since the resurrection. We are one with every believer who has ever lived and will ever live. And so I want to invite you to focus on that commonality. And then I want to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to do that work of conversion in you, to commit to that work being done in you, to be able to sit before God and say, you are up to something. I am not finished yet, but I'm going to continue to desire that you would do that work in me. And then if you've had some time to sit and the, the, the band's playing and we're, we're singing a song, just whenever you feel led, feel free to stand up and join in that song. But I'm going to pray now 
for us, for our local neighboring churches, for every church that is, as we as the body of Christ, the church, take communion together. You can take the bread and the juice whenever you feel ready. Father, we are so thankful that you have, in your infinite wisdom, drawn believers together as the church. And Lord, let us never forget that at Temple, we are not simply a church. We are part of the church, God. And Father, I just pray that all of the churches in Sarnia, in our community, would have a unity and a oneness that's in you that transcends every single disagreement over non-essentials. Father, I particularly lift up Anthem Church, God, our brothers and sisters in our fellowship, that you would bless that community, that your spirit would fall, that you would develop the commitment that is there to you, that you would bless them, that you would keep Satan away and build a hedge of protection around them. Father, I lift up Blue Water, particularly as they launch this new campus that's been open just a month now, God. I pray that you would fill those pews with people who are hungry to know you and to be converted into your image. I pray that you would maintain their campus on Wellington, God. Launching a new campus is never easy, Lord. And let it not become a church split, but let it be one church at multiple sites where you are lifted up and glorified and where people who have no access to the Wellington campus find themselves drawn to the Divine Street campus. And Father, I lift up here on Baptist, God. I pray that you would just let your grace overflow those walls. You would make them a place that serves their community for your name's glory and for your sake. And Father, I lift up every church in our community that honors you and seeks you as Lord, that stands on your word and the truth of it, that is inviting the lost and the hurt and the broken into knowing the healing power that only comes from you, Jesus. And Father, I lift up every church that has been since the very day of Pentecost and it will be until you return, God, that we would glorify Jesus, that we would have a unity that convinces the world that you sent him, the Son, to die for our sins so that we may be one, first in you and in him, and one with each other. And Father, let unity within the church, the global church, the church that is eternal, overflow this world let it overwhelm the sorrows and the troubles and the woes that we all see in this daily life. And Father, let that happen until the glorious day when your Son returns, whether that's today or someday a thousand years from now. But let this unity of your body stand and let it endure and give us a commonality with every believer as we share that commission to glorify your Son as we seek to be converted into his image, and as we now, as this body at Temple, renew our commitment to follow you in all things, to lay down our lives. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen.